an inspiring inspiring speaker i, I mean i can go on a lo- uh, i can go on about his achievements but like i again i'd i'd love to invite him and give him the floor rather than just talking about how great he is because that i can do for a very long time so dr carson could i could i please invite you to uh, to share your thoughts and interact with all of us please I, I just changed my background to indicate that I was once young too. So, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I think that's a good way of of starting. That this is a long struggle, and uh, and I think uh, one of the most unfortunate things about Dr. King is that he didn't have the chance to live as long as as Gandhi did, and allow his ideas to develop even further. But um, but I think that one thing I'd like to do, I don't know if the moderator can can handle this, but um, I, I feel a little bit uncomfortable about the kind of one direction in which the conversation is going. I, I, and I just, I don't know whether it's possible to kind of moderate some so, uh, specific questions that um, people might have and that I could focus more on those. Absolutely, absolutely, Dr. Carson. We can we can certainly uh, do that, and I think uh, uh, our participants can also. Uh, you have this wonderful opportunity, all of you, to to ask direct questions to Dr. Carson. So you can actually raise your hands, um, in uh, and or alternatively, uh, you can mention your questions on the on the chat box. Uh, if if I can and, and, take the privilege, sir, to ask you one leading question to begin with, uh, uh, I I think and then like so that's the privilege I can take to ask you, and then everyone's questions will keep coming along. So I I would really like to ask you about your first interactions with nonviolence, uh, and, and how you actually got into. This domain of nonviolence and nonviolent action, and uh, how how that journey sort of led you to Dr. King, I think that's a supremely important question because, like we all as young people know about Dr. King, uh, Gandhi ji, but somewhere to start connecting with them and to deep dive into the the journey itself, we we all need that turning point i think in our life so so hearing your your experience can possibly inspire us and show us some way so thank you well um you know I, it's a it's a long story that i i've actually put in a memoir if you want to look at uh, i call it martin's dream and uh it, but that's the long story the the shorter aspect of it is that uh i grew up in a, in a town where i didn't know very many black people personally, because it was in in New Mexico, there weren't very many black people there at that time. And, uh, and in the town, the only exposure I had was seeing in the newspapers that people my age were black, and they were doing important things. Uh, these were the students in the sit-ins, the freedom rides. I was inspired by them. Um, I was able to meet a few of them um, through student conferences. Uh, one of the first of these people I met was Stokely Carmichael, who was uh, at that time a student at Howard University. And I met him just a few days before the March on Washington. And I remember he advised me, I, I wanted to go to the March on Washington. And he said, well, why do you want to go to that picnic when you can go and join us? And uh, at that Point, I would have had to leave school and give up, you know, my hope of becoming a college graduate, the first one in my family. And uh, so I chose to go to the march instead. And so I happened to be there with 200,000 other people. And I knew really from that moment that I wanted to be part of that. That this was something really exciting in my life. A few months after that, I, I went to another conference they were organizing for a Mississippi summer project uh, to bring students to Mississippi to directly confront um, the Jim Crow system. And uh, the leader of that meeting was Bob Moses, uh, a name that I think some of you 
have heard, but uh, he's an extremely important person in the movement. Uh, for me, he was even more central. I did I never met and talked with Martin Luther King in general, but I in, in person, but I did meet people like Bob Moses, and then later on, so many others that I I could name who were actually doing the work. And I guess that brings back that idea that I have of that it's one thing to change yourself, but to bring that change to the world is a much more difficult and sometimes dangerous process. Um, and and I saw people taking on that danger. Um, and I and I think one of the themes that I also put into my later career as a scholar is the notion that change comes from the bottom up, not from the top down. That real change has to come from the bottom up. That if it's imposed from the top, it's it's always going to be um, a fragile reality because ultimately people have the freedom to challenge it. And uh, so I saw through that experience of people my own age challenging the system that exists and eventually surmounting, or I guess the best thing I can say is that they replaced these systems of injustice that existed in the South. And, uh, you know, so that gave my life meaning. It gave my scholarship meaning. It, it meant that rather than simply becoming a college graduate, I wanted to be a college graduate to do something with that, to, to make a change in the world. And um, so I think that that was the transformative experience that I assume that many of the young people are going through themselves. Uh, what is your purpose in the world? What, what do you, would you like to see accomplished during the course of your life? And sometimes those dreams become very radical, you know, a lot of change I'd like to see in the world. And, uh, and I think one thing that's similar with Gandhi and King is that many of their dreams were not realized. And Martin Luther King talked about that toward the end of his life. I may not be there to see it, but that's okay. Because I, I know that I've set the world in a different direction and that there are other people willing to take up that struggle and complete it. You know, and, and I think that's, that's the nature of what um, I see all of you trying to do is trying to say, what is my purpose in the world? Um, I actually believe that uh, one of the reasons why I was drawn to the movement is that it was just much more exciting than ordinary life. And, uh, you know, I didn't want to just have a career. I wanted to have a life. And there's a difference. And so I think that those are the choices that are in front of everyone I see on the screen. Uh, even, the, even those of us who are older, we're still trying to do it. We're still trying to build that life that we can, uh, you know, and, and that Gandhian phrase, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. You know, that, that made a lot of sense to me. Um, so I, I think that that's, that's a voyage. One, one of the themes that I learned from Ella Baker, another great person in the movement, is the notion of the long distance runner. That many of us think that the struggle is kind of a sprint. And so I hear these phrases like, yeah, I used to be in the movement, but I kind of burned out. And I've never quite understood why, <laughs> why that should burn you out. I mean, because if you're doing something that inspires you, it can't burn you out. It can realize your potential. It can open up. You might get tired <laughs> at, at certain points in your life, but that's quite a different experience of saying, well, I used to be an activist when I was younger. But now I kind of focus on my own career. Well, why can't you make your career your activism or activism your career? 
you know all of these choices i think are are open to everyone and uh you know part of the reason why people are drawn to movements is that they're exciting they they fulfill something in your life that is missing before so uh so i think that that's the choices that um you know but well first of all i'd like to hear from from people about the choices that you are going through and and maybe i can help in terms of guiding just from my experience but I, I think all of you recognize that all of us have different experiences and we're going to have different stages of our lives uh, thank you so much uh, dr carson for that uh, very insightful and and actually very encouraging uh, response uh, we have a question um, from simon who is one of our uh, one of our participants and actually youth speakers so simon would you like to ask your question or would you like me to read it out i think it'll be nice if you ask it yourself uh, with dr carson okay thank you very much uh, dr carson and thank you for such uh, an inspiration you you are an inspiration to most of us young people and also when you speak about how movements are exciting they are inspirational i kind of look back and then see myself in that boat because I love it. I love doing this work and, and, and it inspires me each and every day. So I have, I have read quite a number of content on civil resistance, on, on, on the civil rights movement that uh, I know that you, you are really part of. I, I, I really want to learn from you about some of the key challenges uh, that you faced as a movement and how did you overcome them? Because I know some of these challenges are similar and, 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 and we grapple a lot in our daily lives here and there to find practical solutions that can help us. And I'm thinking that uh, some of your submissions on these solutions may be of help to us. Thank you. Well, thanks for that question. By, by the way, where are you? Oh, I'm based in Uganda, in, in East okay. Africa. Yeah. Yes. Thanks for letting me know that. Um, I I think it's to me the best lesson that I can convey is just that persistence. That the people I know who you know are what I would call ex activists, you know, and I I think have just not expanded their imagination to the forms that activism can take and that building um, a career as someone bringing change to the world you also I think one of the lessons is be grateful for the small victories that you do experience you know that when you look back getting a, a voting rights act passed was an important Thing to happen it was worth giving your life just for that but to see other kinds of changes occurring because you stuck with it i think are also important so just be grateful for the small victories but also be willing to accept the disappointments that the victories that you did not have or the setbacks you know for someone like myself who sees that the voting rights act that I struggle so hard to achieve is being decimated by um, people in this country or when you struggle I can for South Africa to bring democracy and you see uh, a nation run by people who are in it for themselves through greed and other things that enter into the picture you know you you see disappointment and you understand that Gandhi never saw the goal that he was struggling for the most and that is you know the independence you know that it uh, King I think if he had lived he would have also had a great deal of disappointments and during his lifetime he talked about that 
about those disappointments. But you also appreciate the other side. You appreciate the, the fact that some change that you dreamed about, you actually were able to witness. And, uh, and I think that balance of disappointment, joy in the small victories, that's what makes uh, a long distance runner. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Carson and, and Simon, again, for your question. I think it's a question we can all relate to in our in our respective uh, journey. So I, I will... Uh, uh, I, uh, Kishore, uh, one, one thing I wanted to, to kind of point out, you know, I had that banner about the anti-war movement. I remember um, my first organizing effort to try to build that on, on the UCLA campus. And after weeks of organizing, trying to get people to come, I came to the meeting, there were six people there. And I was profoundly disappointed. And, but yet, later on, two or three years later, I saw thousands of people. So that meeting with six people was worth doing, even though it... I was devastated, you know, that, you know, all of this, you know, and are we going to change the world, all six of us? Are we going to end the war, all six of us? And uh, so that that's going to, going to the meeting with uh, where you're disappointed or when you feel like the meeting didn't result in anything good. Um, Quite frankly, I think that that led me to think that maybe meetings were not always the best way of building movements. Uh, certainly, Dr. Carson, and it's something that uh, I think many of us who are working in mobilizing young people uh, towards this effort, we, 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 we face this challenge. I think this was such a gem of an uh, anecdote that you've shared uh, towards the end. Uh, I know Dr. Dr. Mack was raising his hand. so. Dr. Mack, followed by Devesh, we have a couple of uh, uh, questions and then Edward has, has a fantastic question. So these are the three that we're taking in this order. So Dr. Mack, over to you. Actually, thank you, Keshav. I'll yield to, to, to the younger persons who have questions and comments. Uh, I think Devesh would be next. Um, thank you, sir. Thank you, Keshav. Um, Dr. Carlson, I've heard a lot about you and from you over the last two years at different events which the diocese hosted. Um, my question is that you spoke about um, change which comes from bottom to the top and at the same time I've heard uh, many of the people associated with the World House Project to be talking about the ideology or idea of non-violence. Um, so over years I've seen how idea usually divides people and idea creates identity and eventually people divide. So how do we reconcile an ideology with change which comes from bottom to up and not up from top to down? Because top to down is that idea sometimes gets forced. So that's my question, sir. Well, that, that's a very profound question. Yeah, I, I, I think it, it's, uh, it gets to the heart of perhaps one problem I have with um, someone who many people do believe that Leadership comes from the top down, not from the bottom up. But I don't think movements, I think we can be inspired by leaders. But I quite frankly think that the notion of a charismatic leader is a very dangerous notion because we become dependent on that kind of a leader. Um, and when we're deprived of that leader, as we were with Dr. King, um, things fall apart, and uh, and and I and I think often it puts enormous pressures on that leader that one person should not have to bear, and and I and I can see that now now that I can see from studying King all all these years 
how much that pressure must have cost him. You know, there's a, a psychiatrist who's been working on, on Dr. King, and you know, I, I, I don't believe in all these psych, uh, psychological analyses of, of people that you've never really had in therapy, but I think it's very clear that there were just physical results of all the pressures on him, that he was hospitalized, hospitalized um, because of all the, the pressures. And that that was because we have this notion that, that there are these char charismatic people that we need to, to um, carry out movements. But I, I think that we can have different models of leadership. Um, the servant leader idea, that the leader is the servant of the people and that that's the way we should think about it. And, and one of the goals of leadership is to, is to delegate so that you bring more people into that circle. And I think that's something that Dr. King did quite well and that Gandhi did quite well of bringing other people into his circle so that they would learn the, the lessons. And when you are taken away from the movement or um, there's other people who are able to carry on. So, um, so any kind of, of movement that kind of leads to that dependence on, on a single person is, um, is I think weakened by that dependence. And in and, and saying that though, you know, obviously there are people who are better speakers. Um, I, I was enthralled by Dr. King's oratory. And I, and I, but I was also inspired by John Lewis's speech at the March. He wasn't quite at the level of Dr. King and uh, his, his oration. I could probably repeat it from memory today if somebody could be that articulate. Um, that's a special skill. But I, I don't think, and for, you know, I, I mentioned Bob Moses would be in, in, you know, at the other end. Uh, you know, he, he wasn't a public speaker but I think he had an enormous impact on the movement and, and on me. Uh, thank you, Dr. Just one thing I'm saying, uh, Keshav, is that you don't have to be um, the great orator. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I, I, think, I think you are supremely articulate and, and and uh, but there's only one Dr. King per generation. For sure. Uh, actually, uh, I, I myself was a very, very scared uh, teenager when I heard uh, the phrase, I have a dream. And I think uh, when that uh, when Dr. King is concluding that speech, it almost sounds like a crescendo is reached in a in a rock song uh, when he goes towards the end. So it was actually one of the most empowering moments for me as a teenager to get over my fears and start believing that I can also have a dream. So this is one reason that being at the World House Project and uh, being here doing this is means so much more to me than uh, than anything. Uh, so so Dr. Carson, thank you for that, and I completely agree. Uh, we have a couple of uh, so Dr. Mack, thank you for uh, for giving the uh, for letting our our young uh, younger participants uh, ask the questions. So continuing with the questions, we have Edward, and then we will have Ganga um, who who has questions. Ed, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, I think I also saw Nikki had his hand up, and I've I've asked the question already, so I wanted to to defer first. But otherwise, happy to ask. Okay, so, so let me get to Ganga and then to Nikhil and then we can come back to you. 
uh, and and also just before we do that i want to tell you every tell everyone that every friday at 10 am uh, pacific time the world house project uh, uh, which is organizing this entire turning point summit we have our our weekly meetings uh, where several of these themes are discussed so for all of you who are not the members of the world house project as of now i will highly highly encourage you to join in and um, so we can continue on these discussions even uh, even in our weekly meetings um, and i I've, think i've also yeah. i've also opened up a a uh, monday um i guess i call it the office hour uh mondays at 3:30 uh pacific time for those of us for those people and it goes on till 5 but uh after 4:00 everyone who's not a teenager has to shut up <laughs> but uh so i've set aside a half an hour before the the young people come in to the room and after that you're 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 forbidden to say a word because i don't i don't want the conversation with the young people to be interrupted so we will email you all the details about the office hour and the world house project uh, ca- calls as well and we hope that you you do join us uh, ganga would you like to ask your question i think it's a very critical question and then nikhil so thanks ed for for being so uh, nice uh yeah thank you and as you said sir i think we do need more young voices in this platform cuz um i'm in the uk right now and i don't see many young people it's like there's a trend of young people not having the hope or like the motivation to move forward this uh, movement that we have here and at, and i don't see young people voices at the top i don't see voice of women voice of people of color at the top so i would like to ask this how can we encourage more young people more people who are who don't have the privilege of you know thinking about this who have their own crisis going on if you like look at ukraine young people don't have you know they're fighting for their lives so they don't have the privilege to actually you know think about fighting for others fighting for a global movement as such so how can we make young people how can we promote this how can we have more hope for them and you know for others as well but like you know uh, like as this meeting is going on i think um we would need more young people to you know engage in this than i would i myself would you know have the courage to you know speak more openly so yeah so how can we you know uh, just promote this to people of my age and my gender thank you uh thanks for that that suggestion um i i i think the main way i would look at that is is from my experience the most meaningful interactions were were with people my own age and i think that you have to do that um i mean when the idea of the working group is that anyone can form it i mean Kishoth has taken the the lead in terms of doing this and is I admire the work that it has taken to bring the, all of you together but there's nothing that stops any of you from forming your own working group uh starting with the people around you um I look upon the world house project as a facilitator any any of you could join us tomorrow and come in and say look i want to form a working group of of women who are interested in changing the world and do it and start with the people that you know and because of the miracle of digital communication it can grow from there um i i think that when when i think back at how quickly the civil rights struggle grew just through very primitive communications 
telephones and things like that, uh, relying on mass media like newspapers. Uh, despite those limitations, I, when I think of what we could have done in terms of bringing attention to what was going on in the South, if we had had access to Zoom, if we had had access to modern uh, cell phones. And, and in fact, just, just to take that example, when the three civil rights workers were killed during the Mississippi summer, if they had had cell phones, they would be still be alive today. They would have been able to call from their jail cell and say, this is what is happening to me. And, and just think of how that has changed, how that one young woman who had a cell phone when George Floyd was being murdered changed history. And uh, so that's, that's the possibility. And so I encourage you, um, don't listen. <laughs> uh, when I was, when I was the, a certain age, I didn't trust anyone over 30. Uh, you know, I, I might have listened to them, but I wanted to form a movement of people my age. And so I could be inspired by Martin Luther King, but I wanted to work with Bob Moses and Stokely Carmichael and John Lewis. I mean, they were, they were my age. So please do it. And, and, and again, we will help you facilitate that. Thank you. I think that, you know, the things you said, it actually motivates me, you know, to actually form a group myself. So yeah, thank you for the encouragement. It's really required. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carson and Ganga. Uh, Ganga will also be actually presenting. Uh, she has authored a brilliant piece on uh, the from the Youth Declaration with Nikhil, who will be our next uh, uh, person asking the question. They are actually presenting tomorrow and for the youth co-creation strategy. So Ganga, thank you for your continued uh, efforts and leadership uh, to develop the, those outcomes also. So thank you. Uh, Nikhil, uh, over to you, please. I would like to thank uh, every single one of the speakers here to essentially you know, guide us, the youth, in order to, uh, in order to you know just uh, overall make us understand what nonviolence is. Uh, I do understand that all of you have really busy schedules. Second off, thank you Ed for uh, please uh, giving me the chance to speak. So uh, now that I have a question which is uh, kind of conflicting. Uh, I hope that uh, I'll be able to find the answer. Uh, uh, sir, uh, what I see uh, has been happening in all the definitions given of... Hey, Shiv and Nikhil, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, Nikhil, we, we're having a difficult time hearing you. I don't know if oh, you can make an adjustment yeah. with your headphone. Yeah, yeah, I, I'll just please give me a second. Am I audible right now? Yes, that's better. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so first off, uh, I want to thank uh, every single one of the speakers for being here and essentially guiding the youth. Second, Ed for giving me the chance to ask the question. Uh, sir, uh, I have a question which might be a tad conflicting. Uh, as what I see is in all the documents mentioned, uh, it's like non-violence essentially uh, stems up to think about violence at all. Uh, but I do believe something and it is, you know, it's something which conflicts my mind is that sometimes violence is necessary in order to promote non-violence especially for the greater good for example uh, you know i just think about some uh, instances where if we as people as we have discussed in our conversations it is essentially that the power lies with the people and if uh, in certain circumstances we as people had banded together and actually used violence maybe we could have prevented some instances of the exploitation done to us. For example, in the Indians, when the Britishers were conquering, essentially first war was with the uh, with one of the rulers of Bengal. And I think if we had won that, maybe the Britishers could not have captured India and made us suffer for overall 160 to 200 years. So uh, what my question essentially to you is, uh, do you feel that sometimes violence 
can be something which is important in order to promote non-violence for the greater good or for the greater purpose. Yeah, the, that's essentially it, sir. Thank you. Well, I, I suspect that um, there'll be a number of people who might disagree with my my answer, but I, I would say yes. I think the to me, the argument for nonviolence is not that violence doesn't ever work. I mean, I, I think that the spread of Nazi Germany would be an example of, of eventually some violence had to be used to win that war and to get rid of that evil um, and to save a lot of other lives. Um, I, I don't, you know, G Gandhi is, was not naive about war. He had participated in war, not as a, as a soldier, but early in his life, he, he saw war firsthand. And uh, so I think he understood that 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 was something he was trying to f build an alternative to that, and saying over the long haul, you might use nonviolence to stop someone from murdering somebody, but in the long run, nonviolence is more effective and brings about a peace at the end. Uh, at the end of World War II, we didn't have a peace, we had a Cold War that went on and killed tens of millions of other people. So it didn't solve the problem of war, but it just got rid of one of the main perpetrators of violence. So I think that um, my own view as a historian, I, I'm I think it's naive to believe that nonviolence can conquer everything. Um, maybe over the long haul, it's the best way of getting to a better world. Anything that is achieved through violence can be overturned by violence. Uh, so I think it, it, it's that longer term aspect of it that, that makes it make sense to me. Um, also, what I said at the very beginning is that nonviolence is necessary but not sufficient. Nonviolence has to be mobilized, it has to be organized, it has to be core, it has to be strategic. And I think that's what Johnny Mack is is already you know, pointed out. It has to it has to understand that some evil is not simply some person doing an evil thing it's it's systemic and that you have to build a new system you have to build a new way of organizing society in order to get rid of that systemic violence um that you know to me poverty is systemic violence it's you have to build a society in which people don't have to steal in order to survive. And uh, so, so I think that that's, that's part of thinking through and maybe I, I'm, I'm sure in your discussions, as you get deeper into the study of nonviolence, you'll understand that it's not naive. It's, it's something that can be thought through and can be tested of, by history itself. And uh, and we we should not ever overstate it because that leads to disappointment, you know. And and I think that's part of what happened in the movements that I mentioned beginning at the in terms of the civil rights movement. There was an expectation that these victories would bring about better lives for everybody, and when they didn't. There was that anger and disappointment that did lead to violence. So, um, so I think these are the kinds of things that need to um, don't. I think you've, you've raised 
a very important question, in other words, that I think you should continue to press because it should not be ignored. It should not be, um, you know, sometimes when I've been to nonviolence workshops, I feel like I'm, I'm the skeptic who's going to ruin it all because I'm going to raise questions. And I, I think that it's good to raise those questions. It's, um, it's naive not to. Yeah. You know, Clay, one way, if I may, Keshav, uh, this is such an important question that Nico has, has asked, and it often makes would-be nonviolentists uncomfortable to even try to answer. But, you know, when you think about it, um, there's the idea of the violence of nonviolence and the nonviolence of violence. You know, and and this is rooted in. This, we mentioned earlier the the issue of the greater good. You know, what is the greater good? But there's also the issue of the greater harm, and I think that's what Dr. Carson is speaking to. Uh, you know, when you think about the example he used of, um, you know, you know during the Nazi uh, uh, regime and and the Second World War. Um, these are very difficult questions and the nuances are difficult as well, but we, we must grapple with them. 